Hi, I'm Ed Anath uh, from Apogee, and um, uh, we're going to talk to you a little bit today about um, uh, how to manage APIs uh, within uh, Cloud Foundry. Um, and do a uh, quick review of uh, you know what do we mean by web APIs? Where do they sit within your architecture? Um, why you want to uh, manage them and um, uh, the approaches that we took to uh, integrate uh, within Cloud Foundry uh, using route services. Um, <clears throat> so most developers, uh, you know, work with APIs every day. So you probably all uh, at, at a um, basic level sort of understand what APIs are. They're a contract. They're the ways that um, uh, the software that you write talks with uh, various services that are um, either within the system or, or uh, 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 distributed APIs, web APIs. Speci specifically, what we um, uh, typically are talking about um, when we talk about API management is uh, is web APIs. And um, typically, a web API, most of the the new APIs that you deal with that are are internet. Um, uh, accessed APIs, web APIs, things that you might be uh, talking to from Amazon or Google or Twitter or any of the various types of, of internet services you connect to, um, uh, have tended to all converge around being uh, JSON-based, um, uh, typically with some form of, of OAuth as the, the authentication mechanism. Um, uh, and uh, you know, we are, uh, and we, we tend to advocate that the open API standard is used for describing these APIs. But this classic form of, of web API has been very um, popular and very successful for uh, letting uh, application developers basically um, open up their applications to external developers. It's what makes mobile possible and, and so on. In fact, um, one of the biggest challenges in, in dealing with, with APIs um, and start dealing with API projects is really trying to understand um, where the APIs are going to sit within that architecture. What is the purpose um, uh, of these APIs? Which applications are, are talking to each other? And what um, we tend to find is that um, there's really about four different places that uh, APIs um, can sit within your architecture. Um, many of you who are building applications that are dealing with front-end uh, clients, perhaps mobile, um, are dealing with, with APIs that are being exposed externally. Um, uh, you may be doing that for the purpose of talking to a mobile app that you yourself have, has built. Um, you may do, be doing that um, to uh, to make it possible for applications that other people um, have written to uh, to talk to your uh, to your application, you might be doing it for various forms of partner integration. And those are really what at the top of this diagram is being shown. Um, a lot of people that that um, we talk to go and say, "Well, you know, we're not really doing that. We're not doing any mobile. We're not um, doing any partner integration." Um, but what they're doing is a lot of uh, integration between their applications. And this is what you tend to see described as kind of um, service-oriented architecture and, and so on, where you've got different applications, and that's really what you're seeing here. Different types of applications are talking to each other via APIs. This tends to be where you see um, perhaps the older styles of APIs, uh, SOAP-based APIs, um, various forms of, of XML-described um, APIs. Um, and then, you know, if you're building proper 12-factor apps, you're probably thinking about how you um, uh, abstract out your back-end resources and sort of um, treat those as services that you're talking to uh, via APIs. And we're seeing that that, that you know, particularly um, uh, for uh, application developers, obviously any application developer that's, that's uh, you know, building on Cloud Foundry or deploying to the cloud is, is building towards uh, that mechanism, uh, you know, treating your 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 backend database um, or accessing it via via some form of, of perhaps REST API rather than than the way you may have done it in the old days of just talking directly um, via JDBC or or what have you to to um, 
uh, MySQL or something. Nowadays, people are, are talking to uh, to their AP, uh, their databases via APIs. And then, you know, most recently, we've seen this idea that your application itself gets exploded or decomposed into a set of component services um, that es essentially are tied together via APIs in the form of of microservices. So. This ends up being kind of the challenge that a lot of people uh, deal with is just sort of when somebody just in a very vague sort of way goes and says, you know, APIs, we're, we're going to build APIs, um, you know, what does that mean? Um, it can cover a lot of ground. Um, and this is just talking about the various forms of, of you know, uh, network web-based APIs. Obviously, uh, you've got your, your language APIs and so on, um, your system APIs that I'm not even talking about in the context of this. Um, so. With that in mind, um, you know, what else do you have to sort of think about in, in APIs? Well, the other thing is that these APIs are all used in different ways. Um, and there's, uh, you know, I, I talked a lot about or talked a little bit about um, sort of the REST style, um, um, you know, and I'm using REST in the technically incorrect way, which is the way that everybody uses it. I'm not actually talking about hypermedia APIs, I'm just being resource based. Um, uh, that is the predominant form of APIs for new API development that, that we're seeing. Um, but, you know, we're seeing that, um, uh, you know, there's really sort of four styles of, of API usage. Um, a lot of the, the um, uh, data access APIs, um, some of you may be using things like OData, um, uh, people that are either part of the Microsoft or SAP ecosystems probably spend a lot of time uh, with that. Um, uh, ecosystem APIs, so these are, are APIs that you're making available to external developers. Pretty much for the most part are REST based. Uh, they're described with Swagger or Open API. Experience APIs are an interesting concept. Um, uh, this is where you're exposing an API really purely for the purpose of having your front end um, uh, client, and it might be a JavaScript based client, it might be a mobile app. Um, uh, being able to to uh, talk to your backend services. Netflix coined this term of experience APIs. Um, uh, the really important thing you have to understand about um, experience APIs is that architecturally, um, they're actually not really designed for reuse. Uh, they're typically not, um, the, they don't go through the same sort of documentation process and so on because um, in many cases, the person who created the API is the only person who's actually going to be using that API. Um, and that, a subject that we could probably go on for hours on because um, uh, if you've ever built an experience API, you know what I'm talking about. If you've never actually built a client side app that uses uh, experience APIs, then it sounds like a horrible anti pattern. And then finally, your sort of classic integration APIs, um, microservices, and so on. Predominantly um, SOAP and REST, although we are seeing um, things like uh, gRPC um, as, uh, as mechanisms for, for uh, microservice APIs as well. Um, so that's kind of the landscape of the different types of APIs um, that you see. How does this kind of play out for typically the people who are building applications? Why are, why are they thinking about this? Why, why are they going and saying, okay, I need, need to manage these? And why do I want to think of these in the context of um, all of the other things I'm, I'm thinking about when I'm building an application that's going to sit within Cloud Foundry? Well, generally what you're trying to do when you're building your application. Cloud Foundry makes it easy for you to uh, scale your application itself, but scaling adoption um, of your applications is really hard. And the way that you do that, the reason why you're, you're deploying all of these APIs is because you basically want to go and bring your application to your users wherever they are. And so that's why you're essentially building these ecosystem APIs, why you're creating these REST APIs is so that um, it's possible for people not to have to go and tie um, uh, and essentially send their users directly to your application. Uh, they can build whatever sort of application experience they want and it can be connected via APIs. And these are sort of the different types of scenarios that we tend to see from a business standpoint that are, are kind of driving these API projects. Um, but when you do that, you've got you know, a whole set of challenges around that. And this is where uh, companies like Apigee um, step in and, and, you know, we're not the only ones. There's a number of, of, of different vendors and 
uh, options, um, but I'd like to be a little biased and say we think you know we're we're a pretty good uh, option on that. But generally, the problem you're trying to solve is first getting visibility into um, uh, all of the API usage, and that visibility is for operational purposes. You want to understand the health of the APIs. You want to see what the latency is for the clients that are calling these APIs. Um, you want to go and see, uh, you know, what do they, um, uh, you know, are, the, are these APIs erroring out because uh, people are using the wrong versions of the APIs or the, are they using the wrong forms of authentication, um, which might indicate that either you've got a documentation problem or it could be a security issue, but you want to be able to visualize that. Um, and generally, you want to be able to go and um, really think about your APIs from really a data-driven approach in terms of whether anybody's using these um, um, and make your decisions accordingly. One of the challenges that people had with sort of the old school version of API service-oriented architecture and so on is that that required everybody in your organization to be a service provider. Everybody sort of became beholden to each other. Um, because people were reusing all of these services that were being created, and that's a good thing. But the problem is, is that there wasn't a lot of visibility into who was doing what. So um, you know, you might decide that you wanted to go and turn off an API because you didn't think anybody was using it, and, and chaos would ensue when you did that. So these are all the sorts of things that, that you know, visibility and analytics um, on top of your APIs gives you, both sort of operational analytics for um, uh, for being able to, to uh, think about uh, the health of your APIs, but also um, giving you sort of the, the visibility into how people are using these APIs. Um, and for some companies, this might actually be core to their business model. We're seeing more and more companies actually using their APIs uh, as something that they even charge for. Uh, the security considerations around uh, APIs um, are also um, fairly complicated. They're not, um, uh, it isn't as simple as um, uh, sort of a binary choice of does somebody have access or not. Um, different types of, of users will have different levels of access to different types of APIs. There will be uh, data in the API payloads that might be made available depending on uh, what level of access that you have. Um, there might be rate limiting that's uh, associated with APIs. For example, um, uh, you know, if you you might see this if you, if you ever built an application that used the Twitter API, um, the basic API that they make available to people, um, you can only call uh, relatively infrequently. Um, you have to be a business partner of theirs in order to be able to call it. I, I don't know what it currently is. Say you know something like you know. 10 times a second or what have you. Um, many, uh, many companies when they're, when they're making these, uh, these APIs available want to basically create uh, different levels of, of access. They may do that because it's a business partner. They may do it just because it's a trusted application. Providing an API, being a service provider, um, costs you something. It might cost you your time and effort. It might be the resources that you're putting behind. Um, your servers and so on. So you want to make sure that you can control these things. And in addition to that, you can also see um, badly designed applications. Actually, we see this all the time with mobile apps and IoT use cases where people build something incorrectly and they basically uh, create their own distributed denial of service attack. Um, and so from a security standpoint, being able to to enforce through policies the ability to do things like rate limiting uh, and so on um, is, is very desirable. And so obviously these are all sort of use cases that people tend to have not even thought about in relation to APIs. When I talk about it, when I say security in relation to APIs, most, most of the time people are like, oh, you mean like an OAuth access token or my, my you know, keys? And yes, at a starting point, um, that is part of, of security, but there tends to be a whole set of other uh, policies and access control rules that you need to think about in relation to APIs that tend not to, um, uh, you know, you tend not to realize you need until it's too late. And then finally, this idea of the developer portal and being able to go and provide uh, documentation, the ways for people to learn about um, 
APIs um, is very important. If you've ever tried to make use of an API and it was um, documented, um, uh, you know, in, in an inadequate way, if the documentation, um, uh, you know, was not in, was not structured using, uh, you know, the, the proper conventions, ideally using things like Swagger, or Open API, uh, to make it very easy for you to understand precisely what you need to send and with as much detail as possible what you're going to get back, um, then you, you, uh, you know, then, then you're going to sort of have an exercise in frustration. Um, and, um, you know, if, if, if your experience in using web, web APIs is, um, has been like mine, you, you'll have seen that there's, um, you know, that there's some situations where it's sort of an API is just a joy to use. You had, you know, half an hour to get something done. You were able to go to the website, find the information, get the credentials you needed, actually try out within uh, the website, um, uh, you know, make a sample call, get uh, example code, maybe it actually generated a curl command that you could just paste into your terminal window, um, and you were just able to be extremely productive. And then there's other cases where it's like, okay, this is just a nightmare, um, and you're really struggling to try to understand it. These are all the types of things that, that ideally, um, uh, you know, you um, would get out of whatever you were trying to do from um, uh, you know, in terms of, of managing your APIs. And this is part of the reason why, why there are companies like Apogee that do API management. And again, this isn't like a product commercial. Um, there's a lot of other alternatives um, to working with Apogee. Of course, we'd like you to come and take a look at what we do. Um, so with all that in mind, how does this tie into uh, route services and what, what um, uh, we've done with Cloud Foundry? Well, so in order to do this, this was kind of an interesting process for us. Um, we really needed to figure out how to integrate into, um, you know, the request stream. Most of what I've talked to you about gets enforced at the runtime level through essentially um, uh, a proxy, if you will. Uh, the um, incoming API requests pass through um, uh, a gateway. Um, that uh, the applies uh, access control, checks the OAuth token, so on, um, captures the analytics. So when we looked at how to do this, um, there were a couple of different ideas. This was a project we started um, about uh, 18 months ago, and we started talking to the folks at Pivotal. And one of the things we wanted to, to try to do was really sort of integrate into the whole service broker mechanism um, for, uh, you know, provide that same ease of use, that, that kind of um, native workflow that people like so much about working with Cloud Foundry, particularly for um, services via the service broker. However, most of what the service broker does is dealing with back-end services. And in the case of, of what we wanted to do, you could think of this as more of a front-end service. And so what Pivotal did was basically um, open up uh, the CF router with this concept of, of route services. And so what happens within um, Cloud Foundry when you go in and uh, hit the, uh, the Apigee tile um, is that essentially we go and we bind our proxy into um, using the route service API um, essentially establishes a callback in the CF router so that requests that are coming into your application, and this can be done on an application by application way, fully respects the, the multi-tenancy of, of CF, um, will then get sent to uh, the Apigee gateway that can then go and, and apply our API policies and, and so on. So this is a mechanism you can use, um, uh, the route service mechanism. I, there was a session on this yesterday, and there's a whole bunch of other uses that you can you can do with it in route services. You can also chain these things. So you could have, in addition to, in our example here, where we're binding that Apigee proxy into uh, uh, you know the CF router, but you could have a, a bunch of other additional sort of um, interceptors, if you will, that that can get a shot at dealing with incoming traffic. Um, but the nice thing is, it's all completely dynamic. Um, you can add it after the fact. Um, you can make changes to it and so on at runtime. And we're going to show you a demo in a, in a few minutes on, on how that works. 
Um, the other thing, though, that we um, ended up doing was also looking at um, how to do this um, uh, outside of the route services mechanism, which was essentially um, allowing you to go and bind in a micro gateway uh, that sits within um, uh, your application. So this is kind of our um, approach for microservices integration, because remember previously I showed you sort of the different forms of APIs. Well, we've seen that the, most of the activity around CF users tends to either be, how do I expose these APIs externally, which is what we're seeing here. I want to talk to mobile. I want to go and uh, have devices. Um, I want to go and build my, my um, JavaScript front ends and so on, perhaps using Angular or React or whatever what have you, or we've got these scenarios where the APIs are actually um, uh, essentially microservices and you want to be able to talk between them. So we had to take a different approach on that because obviously you don't want to necessarily have every microservice request going back out through the CF router and back in again and what have you. So for that approach, we provided a Node.js application that you can actually deploy um, uh, inside your application. Um, uh, there's a technique called the meta build pack that we use to make this easy to uh, to do um, as kind of an alternative approach. So, with all that in mind, um, I will uh, now uh, hand things over to Prashant, who will uh, actually walk you through what the, this uh, looks like in practice, and then we'll take some questions afterwards. Thanks. Thank you, Ed. Um, turn this off so that there isn't any echo. All right, so uh, Ed spoke about the need for API management and some things that you can do with API management. Let me just show that to you in a demo. Okay, good. Firstly, this is the RPG API management screen where API proxies are available and you build your API management activities and tasks on this UI. Right now, this is empty. We do not have any proxies. I'm just going to refresh the screen to prove that. Right, uh, let's use the route services. I have the CLI and I hope this is readable at the back. Uh, currently I have an app already pushed and if I do a curl into that app, you see that there's a simple JSON response, right? So this is the running app. Uh, this is running off Cloud Foundry. Um, in order to attach uh, RPG to the route, I need to create an instance of the service. So we have a service available called RPG Edge, and you create an instance of the service in your environment, which is what I'm going to do now. Once a service is created, you bind this service instance to your route on which you want to do API management. And that would be the next step where I bind this created instance to my route. When I do this, what I'm doing here essentially is also pointing the route to the RPG instance that I want to work with, which is what I showed you before. The moment I bound the service instance to the route, a proxy is created on RPG, on which you can now add your API management features. Okay. Uh, on the API proxy, we have a trace facility by which you can see the requests coming in and uh, all the API management policies being applied on it. I'm just going to try to get the right zoom setting. Okay. And I do a curl again on this, right? The response is still the same, nothing happens, but this time you see that the uh, request has come into, okay, I, I hope this is fairly visible. Oh yeah, okay. Right, so you can see the request coming in and right now it's, uh, there essentially is no API management being done here. Right, now, there are a lot of APIs that you can develop, that you expose, but how do you get other users familiar with this? You know, you need the documentation, you need to put this out, you need to enable some sort of self-service on this. And that's where we have the developer portal that Ed mentioned. Uh, the developer portal looks like this. You could have some documentation, you could have blogs. Um, it has a community forums and so on. And if I go into API, so as a new user, uh, I, I come in, I try to take a look at all the available APIs. I, it's categorized. Our documentation also supports smart docs by which you can also execute the API from the documentation itself and uh, see the request and response. So for instance, if I just fire this, I already see a response uh, that's happening. The APIs that you expose don't need to be limited only to yourself. You can publish this using the developer portal. 
What's also great with the developer portal is it allows self-service. So as an end user, I can come and register myself as a developer. Uh, for the sake of time, I will already use an existing user. Um, so once I register, I have a user. I can now go in and, oh, excuse me. Yep. So I am now registered. I can go in and I can create an app. Um, let's come back to this. Ed spoke about security. Uh, one of the easiest ways to enable security is by doing an API key verification. So I will do that in the proxy now. Um, I'm going to add a few policies uh, so that we start doing this API management. We have a, a wide variety of policies uh, ranging from traffic management, which includes uh, throttling as well as caching policies. We have security policies, OAuth, API verification, SAML assertions. We also have a lot of mediation policies. You can even write your custom code to do what you would like. Um, I will first add an API verification to this. I will also do an adjacent to XML for those who still use XML. Maybe you might be interested in the XML response. And right, these are specifics of how you use it. I will not get into that, uh, but you can also you can ensure that the pro the policies are conditionally executed, right? Uh, so in this case, I'm going to say request dot query param. It might not be too readable there, but uh, let me read that out for you. So request dot query param dot format equals XML. So in case the request, you're requesting for an XML format, that's the only time the conversion happens from JSON to XML and not the other times. Let's save this. Um, Ed also mentioned about spike arrest. I did a demo of the spike arrest policy yesterday. I think there's a fair bit of audience who also visited it yesterday. I mean, you can do a lot of things, but I'm just going to show you some of the key features. Okay. I start the trace again. Uh, let me make a curl back to this and we should see it failing, right? Because we have enforced an API key verification here. How does one get the API key? That's back to the developer portal. Using the self-service, I can create my own app. I can add a new app, give it a simple name, use a callback URL, bind it to a product. A product is something through which we expose APIs. And the moment the app is created, you are given an API key that you can use for your calls. So if I go into this, I see that we have an API key and I can now make a call using the API key and this should succeed, right? Uh, I showed you about the format. So I can also say format is XML where I'm requesting this in an XML. Um, that's a bad escaping with the curl. Okay, let me check this works. What did I do? Yeah, I think I missed the ampersand. Right, and this time you see that the policy is applied where the response is given back to you in XML. So the, the benefit of API management is you do not need to do this in each of the applications that you're developing. This is there at a central place where you can manage the policies, manage what kind of API management you can do on your applications centrally at a single place. Uh, the great thing that uh, uh, is possible here also is, as you said, you want to know how people are using your API. So we also have integrated analytics with a lot of out of the box uh, Reports available, we capture the metadata of the request coming in and the response. So by default, you get information such as uh, the proxy performance, uh, latency figures, response times, and so on. So you see that over the time that we have been making calls, it's already capturing information. Uh, we do not sniff into the data coming in. Uh, we are conscious of that. So you just get the, the information about the request and response. If you do want to pick business specific information, we have a policy for that as well, where you can read the re request, uh, the payload and extract business critical information for you, push that into the analytics, and then you can write your, uh, you can use custom reports where you l build dashboards around the information that you are interested in. Right, uh, custom reports uh, also has drill down features. So yeah, it, it takes a while 
I mean, the demo has been just five minutes long, so it takes a while for the data to get ingested, digested, and aggregated and shown up here. So uh, you don't see that, but um, you could build your custom reports. You could have drill downs, look at more information about the whole traffic. And uh, as I said, if you wanted to precate APIs, you can get that information from this and see who's using your APIs, what are the services being most used, and whatnot. Um, well, that brings me to the end of my demo. I believe we have run out of time as well. Um, like I said, we have a lot more features. Do visit us at the booth. We are happy to show you more features that we have. Uh, you can reach out to us and, yeah. Probably we can take some questions yeah, I think we by the side or offline. Yeah. yeah.